Welcome, everybody. I have with me Dr. Bruce Dalby, who is a mainstay in the Albuquerque and New Mexico music community and has been here for a long time and has quite the impact on the Albuquerque and New Mexico music community in trumpet and education. Thank you for joining me, Bruce. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Michael. It's, uh, it's an honor to be asked. Uh, especially on a trumpet show, because there are a lot of tr really great trumpet players in Albuquerque and New Mexico, and um, I'm, I'm I'm pleased to be considered worthy of uh, inclusion. And and I guess we're going to find out how how trumpet is part of what I do in music. Well, absolutely. Well, you know, there's actually a lot of educators who are trumpet players, and there's trumpet players who are educators, and you're actually both. So where are you from originally? Because it's not New Mexico. Where are you from originally? I grew up in a state, in the northern part of the state that shares one point with New Mexico. I grew up in northern Utah. Oh, okay. Okay. Where in, where in Utah? Logan, Utah. Okay. Which is in the far northern part of the state. And... Um, we were there because my father, who uh, is also a band director, and as a matter of fact, well, I will get to the fact that I used to be a, a school band director, and I may be the only third generation band director you know. Really? Uh, because his father, uh, so my father was the director of bands and music department chair at Utah State University, and his father was a pioneering um band director back in the depression era actually in western colorado and that sort of thing so so i've, I've been in the music business for a long time and tr i started trumpet at age seven i studied with somebody who was a very prominent rather well-known uh, uh, trumpet teacher at the time faye hansen okay unusual in that uh, that of course, in those days, there weren't that many uh, female trumpet players, let alone somebody of prominence and uh, national reputation. And, and I like to think that she got me a good start and I kept plugging away <laughs> trumpet and other things in music. <laughs> so you, you attended Utah State and you graduated from Utah State. I have to look at my notes. I'm sorry. In 76, right, with a degree in music education. Is that correct? Correct. And then I went to Caldwell, Idaho to be a band director. And I was doing high school and middle school band. And in rather, rather a good program. It was a program with quite, quite a good reputation and history. Um, that was a, near Boise. And I was 22. Okay. And uh, teaching students, high school students, four years younger than me. And uh, <laughs> making some mistakes, learning a lot, and growing up a lot. <laughs> yes, uh, been there, done that, understand your plight. Um, so from there, you got your master's degree and your doctorate degree, and I know there's, there's in between there, because we'll talk about that, but so you went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Now, I'm familiar with the University of Illinois, but where... Urbano Champagne is located in which city? Urbana. Urbana. The university is is in it's a twin cities, and the university actually oh. spans spans both uh, areas. Your your master's degree was in eighty two, and in between there, I know you had some travels, and we'll get to that in a second. And then in eighty nine, you got your your doctorate degree in music education, right? Yes. From there, okay. after my master's degree, I came back. Well, I came to Albuquerque for the first time to become the band director at Mazzano High School. Right. And so 82 to 87, that was uh, what I was doing. And okay. the fantastic, wonderful experiences there and that I remember well and, and students that I still know and I can gig with them. Right. Lee Taylor, Milo Jaramillo, for example, were in my band there. And uh, then I left there to go back to Illinois to do my uh, doctorate again in music education. And as I finished, word came out, it's kind of uh, um, serendipitously ab about a new position back here in Albuquerque and loved being here. I, I, had, uh, I had met and married my first wife here and, and we were happy to come back when I 
uh, managed to get that music ed position at the University of New Mexico after finishing my doctorate at Illinois. So, so you, you came back to New Mexico, what year? When did you end it up? When did you come back for UNM? That was 89. Okay, so you, when you taught at Manzano and you said you taught there from 82 to 87, and then from there you went back to, to uh, University of Illinois to get your doctorate. How long did you spend there to get your doctorate? Was it two years? Two years. Okay, now I want to talk about your dissertation, but I will read it specifically. It says, a computer-based training program for the development of harmonic intonation discrimination skill or skills. I wasn't sure because I saw it listed two different ways. Please explain that so I understand it. Well, you know, I was just a kid. I knew something about music and music teaching and had quite a lot of experience, you know, 10 years experience as a school teacher and learned a lot. I think I grew up quite a lot. Is still going off to do a doctorate and what's involved in that and presumably for that becoming ready to be a university professor uh, uh, that's you know a high level thing supposedly and and the daunting aspect of that is is the project the dissertation and so right. um, I was determined not to be ABD all but dissertation okay when I finished to go out and take another job of some sort. And so I went, I was thinking, what should I do? What should I do? Well, it was early in the days of um, computer assisted instruction in music. Uh, this is 1987. And Illinois was a center of that. They had this system called PLATO, program, programmed learning and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, it was actually, it was a networked uh, computer system back in 1980, in the 80s. Right. So it was it was groundbreaking educational computer system, and they actually had a music component. In other words, you could hook up Plato to a synthesizer. Oh, it was me. You could program interaction that way, and and so I had an interest. I had always had an interest in intonation, and. And so I ended up going in that direction. Um, taught myself how to program on Plato with a manual and uh, developed a program. So harmonic intonation discrimination is listening to a passion, passage. And I just did Bach uh, excerpts of, of Bach chorales and identifying, well, is the tenor out of tune? Is the tenor sharp? Is the alto okay. flat? Uh, okay. Plus you could also manipulate it. You could, you could, have one of the voices play sharper <laughs> or okay. uh, to, to in order to if you thought that was the out of tune one in order to tune up right the and so uh, that went forward briskly and I, I was maniacal in not wanting to be ABD <laughs> and I all but, all but dissertation Right. You know, so you go, you go off, you get a job somewhere, and you got that burden hanging over your head. I didn't want that. Right. And so uh, I, I tested it out. I did a quasi experiment, experiment with a instrumental methods class that I was teaching and managed to have a dissertation. Okay. And so the program was designed to teach people to listen for intonation. Is that correct? That was the whole point of the program? make judgments about intonation, but also make manipulations of intonation to see if you okay. could fix existing inaccuracies. Okay. And uh, this, is a, this was a system that was way ahead of its time. So in that sense, I was fortunate uh, to be there. Uh, right uh, place, right time. Well, yeah, but then there's the ambivalence because I've continued as a, a, a primary focus of my creative work as a as a tenure track professor with uh, technology and uh, music learning software, and that's a mixed bag because you spend a lot of time making things work. And they, I've always been pleased with the results, but you know, you, you know the hassles and learning and okay. is, it's and it's. A, you know, if we get into it, it's a kind of a long, sad story about some of the products that I've developed that I think are pretty cool since then. Right. I've been at UNM, and I think they're pretty cool, but they're, they're 
elderly and geriatric at this point for reasons. And we'll and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So, okay. so you came back to UNM in 1989. So, yeah. so what was your position? What what did you do at UNM? What what was your original? You were hired to do what? Well, my position is, is a music ed position. So the, okay. the primary the primary aspects of a music ed position are uh, music ed math, methods classes for undergraduates, uh, academic courses in music education for graduate students, topics like philosophy of music ed, seminar in music ed, research in music ed. Um, and then there's a lot of responsibility for student teacher supervision, mm -hmm. and that's that's a lot of work. Oh, this work. sounds awfully familiar. I have a degree in music education. Trust yeah. me, I, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the one hand, a, a professor position is a very entitled thing, and, and I took that very very seriously because uh, you know you're on your you're on your own boss. You have you're on your own schedule, but I took mm -hmm. it seriously because you know the state invests its resources in your modest salary. <laughs> but expects you to do a good job. And there's really a lot of work involved. So but but in my in my case I needed to fill when I came to UNM I needed to fill out my load with an ensemble and I was given the choice, hey, do you want to do jazz band one or do you want to do symphonic band two? And naively the young kid needing to get uh, a tenure and promotion in music ed, I said, well, I want jazz band one. <laughs> so I, I had some really good experiences with that, but it took a lot of time and I, I did want to make the program better. Mm -hmm. And and so I had a fair amount of anxiety about the, the time that that was keeping me away from publishing or perishing. Um, but I did manage to get tenure after six years and, and, and promotion. And, and coincidentally, that's the same year that um, we were, had been successful in, in arguing, I and others uh, uh, advocating for creation of a jazz uh, studies position. And okay. so in that year, 1995, uh, we hired Glenn Coster, our amazing uh, director of jazz studies uh, at UNM and since then. And so he, of course, took over Jazz Band One, but I continued with Jazz Band Two for a few years. So um, I've done a lot of stuff. I mean, I've taught a lot of ensembles at various levels. Okay. Um, so what is your position now with UNM? Are you retired or are you considered a professor emeritus? What, what? I am, okay. I am, I'm both of those things and more. I'm a working retiree. So I'm <laughs> retired, I'm an emeritus professor, but. I'm really fortunate to be able to continue teaching in an area that that um, has been a very very strong interest of mine, namely oral skills. Ah, okay. And, and so I'm actually currently in my sixth year. <laughs> wow. Teaching part time, so it's it's a quarter time position. I'm still a yeah, but a you're still but you're still teaching, which means you still have a passion for it. Which is, is, which is kudos for you, because some people get to a point where they're like, I'm done, you know, and yeah. it seems like you're not done and that you enjoy teaching and you enjoy working with people and you enjoy doing what you're doing. That's absolutely true. And I, I naturally hope to think that I'm having some sort of a positive impact on students, but I, I still love the process. I mean, I had a, I had a blast with sophomores this morning um, and uh, I monitor myself closely. And, and so I'll even say this to classes, you know, when I, when I'm telling the same story for the third, fourth time, or I make a little side trip, you know, cause side trips in education are rich, right? But you got to come back to your agenda. If I forget <laughs> to come back, then it's time to, to fully retire. But then of course you've got to have the the problem with that is that you've got to have the presence of mind to understand that you're losing it. Uh, so I hope I hope that my friends and loved ones will let me know when it's time. That, yeah, if I'm starting to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You have written a few computer programs that 
are, as you said, are geriatric in nature now, but I'm sure when you wrote them, they weren't. Do you have any computer programs still on the market? Are you working on some? Where Talk, talk to me about that. Again, I call myself the world's most reluctant programmer. Um, <laughs> but, I, but the products I've done, I've been very proud of and pleased with how they turned out. So uh, a little background is that I, I'm, I'm a, a big influence on me is, is a huge name in music education, Edwin, Edwin Gordon. Okay. And uh, he's the coiner of the term audiation, which simply means to think music in your mind. Okay. Um, but he has some compelling ideas about how to approach that process. And I've always, that's been my primary interest in my teaching, but also in my creative work as a, as a professor. And so one program is Audiation Assistant, which is um, the only, still, it's the only published program. And it was with a really good publisher, GIA Publications of Chicago. Um, it's, it's still the only program that uses verbal association, domiso, tonal syllables. Oh, oh, okay, rhythm, got it. And rhythm syllables in um, in audiation development drills that the user can customize to their own level and their own needs. Okay, wait, wait. So I want to make sure I get this straight. In a simpler term, it's ear training? The current term is oral skills. Okay. So oral skills means audiation. Uh, ear training is out of favor because the ear is just a sensory device, like a microphone. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, all right. So what so I was going to do in school in the in the brain, in the brain. Uh, okay. audiation is a cognitive okay. process. So oral skills is a better term, okay. and that just means oral skills. Of course, all universities have oral skills classes associated with music theory classes, and um, that's just a synonym for audiation. And audiation is a synonym for oral skills. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's. It's ear training. Okay. I mean, when I went through school and I was getting right. my degree in music, they called it ear training. <laughs> so your computer program is out there still? Can people can people purchase this? Can people download? Is this a Mac, a, a Windows? What is it? It's like I said, it's geriatric. It's a long, sad story. I'm, I'm able to use it with my current <laughs> student, but it's, it's too rickety to remain a, a, a commercial product. So... Okay. It's a sad story because this wonderful development platform called Director was bought by a certain megacorp and um, and neglected into death. And so, you know, with with OS advancements and changes, you've got to be able to update stuff. And so it became un impossible to update this program and another magnum opus program that, that I haven't talked about yet. Um, and so very, very frustrating and demoralizing. And, and, and besides, I was burned out on programming anyway. But, uh, but you asked, so, you know. I'm well, yeah, to... I get it. So and currently, currently, I am redoing Audiation Assistant on a new platform that was similar in many ways to the one that I used before. But it takes a long time. And um, people my age are not generally considered optimal for programming but i find that i can still do it so good so you now know, that's you're one you're supposed to keep your brain active as you age and uh, you're trying <laughs> so so this is one program do you have any other programs that you have or is it just this one that you've written and that you're trying to rewrite my coolest program is called tuna system and okay. uh, i think it's the the, the neatest uh, music ed program that almost nobody's heard of um, I haven't. What, what, tell me about that. Well, it's a resource for tunes. So uh, what it'll do is it'll display a tune. You can change the key. You can display chord symbols and Roman numerals. You can play the tune. You can designate what instruments are going to play what part. It plays bass accompaniment and melody. Uh, you can change the tempo, you can change the key according to whatever range you're playing in. And, and some particularly cool features that it has that nothing else still does, and this is 17 years later, 
is you can filter. So you can say, hmm, I wonder which ones of these 500 tunes are in major with three chords, one, four, and five, for example. And it will filter that. And it'll filter that. Or you can say, I wonder which one of these uh, has uh, um, an embellishing diminished seventh chord in it. So is this available publicly? It was. Okay, so until, you say it was. Until, until director was killed by this megacorp I won't name. Yo, no, that's and fine. I'm, so una I'm, I'm unable to update it. Uh, it requires MIDI, and there's right. nothing currently, uh, much to my amazement, that um, will do MIDI uh, for that a non-programmer like me. <laughs> so at any rate, I'm, I'm still able to use it with with my students, but that's because I know how to, I know I know where to put the duct tape. Right. It sounds like to me with your filters and everything, I wish this was available. That's really sad. Well, we'll see. I mean, I've I've, I've managed to regain some momentum doing the other program, which doesn't use MIDI; it just uses digital audio. Right. Uh, and so thank you, Donna Schmidt, for recording the uh, the renowned Donna Schmidt, middle school band director, for recording the rhythm uh, audio 18 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. <clears throat> well, for your sake and for our sake, I hope it, both of these programs come out. So let's talk about your performing, because you've been a mainstay in Albuquerque for a long, long, long time playing the trumpet. Um, you've performed in quite a few groups with the longest tenure being in the Albuquerque Jazz Orchestra. You were in the Jazz Orchestra from the very beginning, weren't you? I am a charter member. I, I actually love to tell the story about another um, renowned uh, New Mexico music educator, Pancho Romero. Mm -hmm. who's the founder of the Albuquerque Jazz Orchestra in 82. And that's the year that I showed up here as a kid to uh, take the directorship of the Manzano High School Band Program. And I love to tell the story of how he, when he, when he put the, the AJO together, he put me in there without hearing me play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reputation, obviously. Uh, no, I didn't have a reputation. I, I had been in town a couple of months, I think, but I'm grateful for that because that's been a it's been a wonderful thing. And of course, Pancho left um, some years later. Uh, when I came back from my doctorate, I was I still had a place, and I saw so I was fortunate there, really fortunate. Um, and then he left, and John Sanks gets tons of credit for keeping the Albuquerque Jazz Orchestra alive for a long time. And of course, he was a super busy. High school band director and right. uh, Albuquerque concert band director. So John has amazing capacity for work. And then we were under the leadership of Bobby Shu for some mm -hmm. year, and yeah. that was, of course, that was a great experience. He he has great taste in music, <laughs> so we played yes, some really wonderful literature with him. And then he retired, and and we're so fortunate to have Glenn Coster leading it now, and the group's been going well. And I feel fortunate to be in there just because the level of playing in Albuquerque today compared to what it was when I showed up is way higher. There's so many good players in town. I, I feel fortunate to be in there. Yeah, you guys sound great. And, and so what other groups do you play in? Because I thought I saw, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I thought I saw that you've done some work with Entourage Jazz. Who else have you worked with? been really fortunate for a few years i was the trumpet player it must have been maybe four years or so i was the trumpet player with entourage and had some great experiences there you know because you get to practice you get to practice your your improvising um and plus with great people and great players and i still play with the entourage big band mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the New Mexico Jazz Workshop that you're heavily involved with. Um, you do a lot of work. You work with, uh, now I don't know if it's happening this year or not, but in the past you've done work with youth bands. You've done work with teaching classes. What do you, what, first off, what is your actual position with the Jazz Workshop? Are you, are you on the board or are you just a volunteer and an instructor? I was on the board for a while back in uh, um, 
long, the previous uh, executive director. Okay. No, I mean, all the instructors there are on a con contract basis okay. as, as, as needed. But a few years ago, you know, and I had worked with the, the community band, the adult band, which I enjoyed because, uh, you know, it's, I, well, I need, as, a, as an academic, I need to get back to my roots occasionally. <laughs> Of making music and teaching music musical skills rather than right. you know academic skills and so um, a few years ago uh, Marcus Gottschlich, the uh, current director wanted to reestablish the youth jazz honor big band the youth okay. honor jazz band okay and so I agreed to do that that was 2019 and and you know all about that we we <laughs> we were very successful in attracting the best. A, a bunch of the very best young players in this area. The band was going really well. We attracted a, an amazing benefactor, uh, Joey C, who okay. had all these connections. We had he had super exciting events arranged for us in the spring of 2020. Yeah, and, and then well, we all know what happened. <laughs> Nothing. So, so is that going to start back up? None of them happened. Yeah. Well, it's it's in the consideration stage. Oh. we'll see i hope i hope that that okay comes through. well i hope so too because you guys used to i'm I, you know you know as well as i do i'm in the community band i'm in the, the jazz yeah. workshop big band and you guys used to follow us and you know I, I i used to sit outside and listen to you guys great players good kids so all right well so so let's talk about one more thing because <laughs> I'm a gear guy. I always have been. And and I, I, I'm sure you're going to go, oh, no, it doesn't mean anything. But I'm curious. So what trumpet do you play on? And what mouthpiece do you play on? Anything in particular? I have played a Bach forever. Okay. Was right. it, a, is it a, obviously it's, it's a, it's a Stradivarius. So is it a, which bell do you have on it? Do you know the 43, 37, 72? I have a 37. Okay. All right. Uh, my first Bach was I was age sixteen for Christmas. My 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 parents got it for me. Uh, it was five four seven one zero. <laughs> and do you remember reason, the serial number? Uh, well, I one of the symphony players here back in the nineties tried it out and said, Dude, "This is a peach." And for some reason, about twenty five years ago, I sold it to a student. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the current five four seven one zero. <laughs> I think the current one is a good one. Um, and I play. Uh, I bought this uh, uh, Monet from oh, okay. Ken Erickson some years ago, just because I like the feel of it. It's a B four L. It's kind of not. Uh, a multi-purpose uh, mouthpiece, but it suits me and my fundamentals limitations Absolutely. pretty there's well. Nothing, right? you know, there's nothing wrong with that. My limitations, of, I hope we don't get too far into that. Because no, 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 no. I'm not you know all about trumpet. Yeah, it's, I'm not going into that. You know what? It's a hard a personal thing. <laughs> what? What? I, in musical trumpets and mouthpieces are a personal issue. What works best for you? It doesn't matter. Just just because I say I play this doesn't mean that you have to. Just because you say you play that doesn't mean I need to. It's what works best for you for everything that is required for what you want to do. It's the only reason I ask is because everybody uses something different. You know, mouthpieces are the worst because you could have specific trumpet, you could have a specific trumpets. I mean, I own two and you can have one for jazz and one for classical or for however you want it. But mouthpieces, ask someone a mouthpiece and you open up a can of worms. Oh my Lord. Yeah, it's and there, there are certain people who are, who are uh, 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 holy grail searchers. <laughs> We're always going from one mouthpiece to another. Ken Erickson is one of those. <laughs> yeah, of those you will people. not find that yeah. holy grail ever. Well, as I like to say about certain things, you got to love it. Uh, because whatever instrument you pick, and trumpet maybe more so than any, but certainly more than some, 
you better love it because it's it's a brutal taskmaster and <laughs> and maintaining uh, maintaining consistency on trumpet has been a bugaboo for me my entire life and i know i don't practice enough but i do practice and but i i tend to practice my improvisation and so when it comes time to play easter ta 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 ta, ta that's a challenge because <laughs> That's not how jazz goes. <laughs> no, and I laugh about it because Doc Severinsen once said, the trumpet is a cruel mistress. That's, I'm not going to use that word, but that's the term I was thinking. It's, but it's true. Let's wrap this up. I want to th thank Dr. Bruce Dalby for joining me today. I want to thank you for everything you've done for the community, all the work you do, everything that you keep going, because without you, the AJO is you, I know you are the business person for the AJO. So we appreciate that. We appreciate you keeping things working and thank you very, very much. And we will catch all of you guys next time.